So I'll pass on to Azam, who will introduce Steve, who will give the talk today. Thank you, Michael. Uh, hello, everyone. It's my great honor today, along with Michael, to host Dr. Steve Garvin. Oh, uh, Steve has more than 33 years of experience as an exploration geologist, and he has worked in a variety of uh, countries around. So his main expertise is related to gold and copper projects, and he works as an independent consultant based in Perth, Australia right now. Uh, he's uh, an uh, Agile Research uh, Fellow uh, at the Center of Exploration Targeting uh, at the University of Western Australia, and he has been author and co-author of more than 40 scientific papers and abstracts. Uh, Steve is a Chief Technical Advisor to Salt Gold and Hot Chili, and Technical Advisor to Japan Gold Corporation and Los Cerros LTD. Uh, Steve is one of the leading authorities on porphyry epithermal and condensed uh, site mineralization systems, specifically in Southern Pacific region. Uh, he's been involved in too many projects, and specifically, uh, I can uh, refer to Bato Hihahu uh, porphyry copper gold mine in Indonesia, uh, gold mines of Carlin and Battle uh, Mountain Trends in Nevada, and uh, Cortadera porphyry deposits uh, in northern Chile, and even recently, the world-class Alpala deposit in northern part of Ecuador. Uh, Steve, uh, the platform is yours. Uh, please take it away. Today's talk. Okay, we'll click forward. There we go. Application of Jolly and, and 3D in the discovery and resource expansion of porphyry, copper, gold, molybdenum deposits. Um, and this is a picture of um, Grasberg in Indonesia many years ago, in 1995, the sort of the commencement and early years of open pit mining. Now, this is a great holy ground. And for, for many years, Grasberg was the uh, world's largest operating gold mine as a byproduct to copper. And the, basically the premise of this whole talk is that porphyry deposits contain a lot of metal and they can be found using basic geology. Uh, this is a, a deposit style that's well understood. Um, it's been, you know, people have been doing a lot of work on porphyries for over 60, 70 years. We have a pretty good idea of how. So just a quick summary, I, I know you probably all know what a porphyry deposit is, but if I'm going to be talking to you for 30 minutes about porphyry deposits, I want to make certain that we're on the same page as far as what they are. Very large systems, uh, and they affect kilometers of rock through the amount of hydrothermal alteration and the distribution of silic hydrothermal silicate and sulfide and oxide minerals. However, they're related to fairly Rocks and plutons, typically 500 meters to two kilometers in diameter, that are emplaced within one to four kilometers of the Earth's surface. They often occur in clusters, like the fingers on my hands. You can have a district with several porphyry systems, some perhaps not all economic. They often root down, and where people have done deep drilling, they, they often go down into a large pluton and batholith at depth. Porphyry means they were associated with rocks that are porphyritic in texture. Uh, and so that's a whole discussion of why that is. But for the sake of this presentation, the porphyritic texture is very important. You've got fine crystals, typically feldspars, hornblends, um, biotites, magmatic origin that are up to five millimeters in diameter, set in a very, very fine grained ground mass. There are multiple phases of intrusion. Uh, generally, there's anywhere from three to as many as 12 intrusions that occur over the lifespan of the porphyry system. And where they're well dated, that can be less than 100,000 years. And there's several stages of hydrothermal alteration, as I said, affecting cubic kilometers of rock associating with, associated with each mineralized intrusion. So you, basically what you get at the end of the day, or after the deposit is formed, is a uh, uh, an overprinting spatial relationship that have been caused by several intrusions. Uh, the way the fluids get through the wall rocks 
it's fracture permeability. So it's fractured vein controlled alteration mineralization. And we have a characteristic metal zoning, which is very useful in the expiration of these deposits, commonly central iron, um, be it magnetite typically, copper, gold, proximal molybdenum, distal gold, silver, lead, zinc, manganese, uh, and even further distal perhaps lithium and, and thallium. This is a picture of Bato Hijau, um, where I, I worked many years ago uh, in July of 2000, um, early on in the open pit excavation. Um, and the mine life there is 35 years or so. So we probably have another minimum of 10 more years to go for mining at Bato Hijau. And it's very large. When it's finished, it'll have a two kilometer diameter by 900 meter or, or deeper open pit within eight kilometers of the ocean. Bato Hijau is in Eastern Indonesia on the island of Sumbawa, which you, is near Lombok, which is near Bali. So very quickly, where are porphyries found? Well, they're in magmatic arcs, continental arcs, oceanic island arcs. Um, they are, have a great deal of association of molybdenum with copper, and they typically occur in the cratonic and the continental margin settings. Uh, they also occur in the island arcs. Um, and, and, and also you can have gold rich porphyries, not only in the island arcs, but in the continental margin arcs as well. And we're showing you some of the very large porphyry deposits in the world. Um, those in red happen to be related to alkaline magmas. So in summary, porphyry deposits make up 70% of the global copper, nearly all of them lived in them. 20% of the gold that's produced annually are from porphyry deposits, 80% of rhenium, Nearly all the tellurium, a significant byproduct, silver, lead, zinc, okay? Um, now, if you took a chart of the world's largest 20 porphyry deposits, each deposit at metal values of $3.50 a pound copper and $1,700 an ounce gold, each of these 20 deposits contains more than 100 billion US dollars in copper and 20 billion US dollars in gold. The gold, sometimes silver, molybdenum, typically a byproduct of the copper. Of course, porphyry deposits can also make molybdenum rich deposits. The biggest deposits per deposit have more than a half a trillion dollars, more than 500 billion US dollars in copper, and more than 100 billion US dollars in gold. So these are tremendous uh, repositories of metals and wealth. Now, this is. Um, Vertical zoning through a porphyry system based largely upon Yarrington, but applies, which is in southern, uh, southwestern Nevada, um, but it applies to many porphyry systems. And it's showing you a cross section from paleo surface down to about six kilometers paleo depth. Uh, on the far left, we're seeing zoning uh, in terms of the sulfides, peripheral pyrite, chalcopyrite, sphalerite, galena, increasing chalcopyrite pyrite ratios going into a core of chalcopyrite plus or minus boronite. And then sometimes you might have a boronite magnetite core. And this is showing you the elemental zoning, okay? Um, and so what we see is, is that as you go from away from the system into the system, we have increasing copper over zinc, increasing gold over silver ratios. This is in rock chips, um, in, in drill core, lead over zinc, silver over lead, moly over manganese. And you can see the elemental zoning from high level uh, lithium and, and thallium uh, going through antimony, arsenic, down into tin, tungsten, molybdenum, down into the copper core. And then we have these plume elements, these elements that basically connect the near surface to the top of the economic portion of the deposit, and they consist of bismuth, tellurium, and selenium. So this zoning is really important. It's zoned in terms of hydrothermal alteration. It's zoned in terms of metals. It's zoned in terms of sulfide uh, mineralogy. Uh, and these provide excellent vectors that we can measure and record these various parameters, including things like quartz veins, which we'll talk about later, can help vector us back to not only find the deposits, high grade cord, but better understand their paragenesis. So here we have a picture of the discovery outcrop of the Apollo porphyry copper gold um, silver system in Northern Ecuador, discovered by Sol Gold um, about 10 years ago. Um, we had about 80 meters at 2% of these style of quartz veins, these planar quartz veins. So the trick is how do you take that outcrop, which we have mapped here on the left, we're showing you a, a mapping of the amount of those planar type quartz veins, we'll call them B-type quartz veins, using the nomenclature of the Gustafsson and Hunt 
seminal paper on the El Salvador deposit in Chile, 1975. Um, how do you take that map, bring it into a 3D environment, which initially might just be a series of level plans and cross sections and drill hole abundance into what we have here is a slice out of a 3D model. And then how do you relate parameters such as the quartz vein abundance to grade, all right? And how do you use that to not only expand your resource, but how to find more deposits and to help with establishing your, your resource and mining reserve estimates. And that's the topic of this talk, giving you a few examples. Now, the first example is from Batu Hijau. This is where I did my PhD, uh, sponsored by Newmont. I worked with Newmont for about 10 years in Indonesia and Nevada uh, and elsewhere in Southeast Asia. Uh, Batu Hijau is a wonderful porphyry deposit. Um, and uh, this is an example of an outcrop uh, at one of the drill pads. It has about 10% quartz vein abundance, okay, by volume. This is something we can estimate visually and quantify, which is important. You can quantify that in the outcrop, you can quantify that in the drill core. And there you'll see on the, on the right-hand diagram, we have in green is the limit of biotite alteration, hydrothermal biotite alteration indicating temperatures greater than 300 degrees Celsius. And then we have here in pink, uh, the mapped surface tonalite porphyries. We have the ore deposit at 307 meters above sea level. So the very top of the pre-mining ridge was about 650 meters, uh, going down to valleys that were perhaps maybe 400 meters above sea level. This is the projection of the ore body at an outline of a half percent copper cutoff, projected to surface. Then we see the first three drill holes, one, two, and three, right into the ore body as it worked out. But most importantly, for mapping the surface streams, roads, and drill pads, we have an outline of 5% quartz veins. And you see how the 5% quartz veins directly predict, that surface directly predict the ore body at depth. Very useful tool. Now we'll go to Ecuador, uh, northern Ecuador, uh, the solid gold discovery in May 2012. This is what the out, one of the bits of the outcrop looked like. It was basically an 80 meter wide zone at 2% veins. And it might've had a 20 meter zone at 15% veins, okay? This is the creek of which the solid gold geologist walked up in 2012 and said, Eureka, there's something below here. This is of interest, okay? This area had been known for 30 years and was no, well known for so peripheral epithermal uh, lead zinc gold silver veins and some low grade porphyries. Apollo hadn't been recognized until 2012. The first real drill hole that went deep was drill hole five. And at about 700 meters below surface, it basically hit uh, where the finger, the finger outcropped at 20 meters width, if you will, at surface. And the, this hole went down through here and hit the hand at about 700 meters down hole, 550 meters vertical beneath surface. And that hand opened up and continued down to over two kilometers beneath surface for what's turned out to be a 3 billion ton ore body, and it was given here at the start. Recognition, the style of quartz veins being important. So this would be some channel samples from that discovery outcrop area. And you can see there was about 30 meters at 0.65% copper, a gram gold, 54 meters at 0.3 copper, 1.4 gold, individual one to two meter samples that ran up to 4.9 grams gold and 1.3% copper. Strongly phyllic altered. Uh, this is if you're looking at drill core at depth, depths of almost a kilometer downhole, and you can see the style of veining, the style of alteration, uh, abundant chalcopyrite, of which most of the copper and gold is associated with in this porphyry body. So very sexy pieces of core, but you keep in mind what you saw at surface and what that opened up to at depths of more than a kilometer downhole. Okay, so um, basically I worked with Sol Gold on this um, from drill hole six or seven onwards. And um, we worked on using this anaconda mapping method, what I learned at Bata Hijau from other people, such as Marco Naudi and John Prophet and John Dillis. Uh, and we applied that. We had a mapping course in the field in Northern Ecuador. And the, one of the first things the team did is they went ahead and they went ahead and mapped the discovery outcrop area, which is in this region in here, um, at one to, was it 500 scale? Yeah, pretty detailed. Uh, and so what we have here is a series of dikes color coded by age and some faults and the first nine drill holes, if you will. Um, 
very importantly, they mapped out the abundance of the B-type cord stain. So those pictures I showed you. This is a good proxy of copper abundance. Copper, between chalcopyrite, between pyrite sulfides are in the veins and in the wall rock, the fractured, microfractured wall rock to the veins. And so we see here in yellow, um, a half percent quartz veins or orange, the 80 meters at 2% veins in green going into a very narrow zone of 20% veins over a, a width of maybe about 10 meters, if that. And we can see that you, we map the veins and, and the geology in the streams. Uh, the slopes are covered in jungle, um, so you don't have any outcrop. But we can see that this system was open to the north northwest and open to the southeast. And the geologists plan a drill hole. We'll call it B prime. Now, when they drilled B prime, that became drill hole 12. And that was stunning. Uh, 1.6 kilometers at 0.6% copper and a half a gram gold, including 600 meters at a percent copper and 1.2 grams per ton gold. Uh, and that is still the best drill hole to date on the project simply by projecting a long strike to the southeast, the extension of the zone, the zone of abundant B-type quartz veins with copper sulfides in them. Right, and they also mapped the chalcopyrite abundance, pyrite abundance, and dividing one by the other, we get the chalcopyrite pyrite ratio, which again is basically sailing in the direction of an increasing copper over sulfur ratio, which is typically towards the hotter portion of these porphyry systems in many cases, and we can see here, very similar, the discovery outcrop in this region here, a similar pattern to what we saw for the B-type quartz veins, um, open to the Southeast clearly, and drill hole 12 again gave you that amazing result. So in, in this mapping exercise, the abundance of B-type quartz veins and the chalcopyrite pyrite ratio worked in concert to de determine still the best drill hole to date out of the 250 kilometers of drill holes drilled. That's how that drill hole was cited, geology. All right, so let's say we'll, we'll run with the B-type quartz veins as an example. We make some cross sections. Uh, we color the coated up by vein abundance. Um, we go ahead and do some hand-drawn uh, sections, hand-drawn level plans, put it together in 3D. And ultimately we can make a 3D model, which I'll share with you in a moment. But here's just to show you, there's many phases of intrusion in this deposit. And what we have here on the left in green are the volcanoclastic host rocks. And then we have a pre-mineral diorite in yellow. We have the mineralizer, uh, the QD10 in magenta, and then subsequently later intrusions that are bringing less and less metals to the party. So the purple guy, the magenta guy, brought a lot of copper and gold uh, to the party, if you will. And the house was the pre-mineral diorite intrusion and the garden was the surrounding volcanoclastic host, host rocks. And each subsequent intrusion brought metals to the party, but subsequently less and less and less until we got to these post-mineral barren dikes where they basically broke up the party, they called the police and it was game over. But fortunately, um, they're volumetrically very small so they only have a minor dilution to the deposit. So what we're having here is showing you the abundance of B veins by intrusion stage. And this is very similar to the abundance of copper and gold. So there's a direct correlation between the abundance of B-type veins and the amount of metal in the system. And that is handy. So here on the left-hand side, we see the color-coded intrusions, color-coded in the same for the amount of copper and gold. And then we see the 0.3% copper equivalent outline in blue and the 0.9% copper equivalent outline, and that's a cutoff grade. So the average grade of rocks that exceed 0.9% is almost 1.5%, 1.4% copper equivalent for over 420 million tons. So again, this is the, the, the finger from surface going down to the hand at depth. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. The discovery outcrop giving you the finger going down into the hand. And this cross section is more than one and a half kilometers tall. Good relationship of grades to vein abundance. You can map the vein abundance, measure the strike and dip, quantify percent volume. You can count up veins per meter, average thickness, determine volume percent in drill core as well. This helps. So here's a plan view um, showing you a strike length of over two kilometers using a cutoff of 0.2% copper equivalent, cutoff of 0.45% copper equivalent, and again, that 0.9% copper equivalent. 
this, you know, basically we had a series of fingers. We had about three different prospects that joined up into the hand at depth when we drilled this. And now what you're seeing here is the projection to cut off from depth to surface. And I'm going to give you a series of give you cross section, longitudinal section, and even a level pan at 500 meters RL. So there's over 230 kilometers of drill core. I think maybe even 250, I'm not certain, somewhere in that range now for the deposit, including geotechnical work, metallurgical sample holes, et cetera. So look, we'll look at that cross section. So we're looking northwest, southwest is on the left, northeast is on the right. The far left hand diagram is showing you the vein abundance, all right? Uh, the drill hole traces are color coded by copper equivalent. So black is more than one and a half percent copper equivalent, very high grade. And you see here, uh, we, and then we have uh, the point. 9% um, copper core um, in black in the middle associated with the yellow and magenta intrusions going up to 0.3 all the way to surface. Um, late stage hydrothermal breaches, which dilute and break up the system. Uh, and look at the, the vein abundance. In, in red or pink is 5% veins, B-type quartz veins. In magenta, greater than 10%, going all the way out to a half percent, which we can model. Okay, about a hijau, anything above even a half percent was also interesting. Um, and 5% directly overlay the ore body. Here, 5% fits almost perfectly with the greater than 0.9% copper equivalent, the one and a half percent copper equivalent average material. So making a quartz vein model is useful here. And if you're drilling up in here and you hit a few veins, you, you definitely want to drill deeper and persist to go from a half percent to 2% to 5 to 10% vein to where you get higher grades. Now, the far right-hand diagram is molybdenum. And something that's very interesting is the geologists were logging uh, routinely were there what the presence or absence of molybdenite on fractures and anywhere from 0.1% molybdenite up to higher values. So about six to 10 ppm molybdenum corresponds in the assay corresponds to what the geologists would note as having the presence of molybdenite on fractures. And so we see this beautiful sort of donut. You see there's the high grade portion is less than 10 ppm molybdenum and the higher molybdenum, which isn't economic, but is of interest and you can visually see it for the molybdenite on fractures is about 20 ppm, 20 ppm makes a beautiful halo. So if one is drilling and starts getting molybdenite on fractures, you keep drilling and then they'll decrease and you'll get into the high grade core and then you'll drill back out through the midnight halo out into the country rock. So another set of zoning is useful to know about when you're testing the style of porphyry system. Left-hand diagram again is the B-type vein abundance with copper grades for reference. The center diagram is the chalcopyrite pyrite ratio from drill core. And we can see where you have a ratio of 0.5, which is equivalent to one chalcopyrite to two pyrite, you're starting to get into the system where you have more than one chalcopyrite to one pyrite, so a ratio of greater than one in red, you're getting into the high grade core. In this system, we have a small amount of bornite. It is bornite in equilibrium with uh, pyrite. It's late stage high sulfidation bornite, okay? And it's not a lot. So generally it models at 0.3%, and we find most of that up higher in the system associated with phyllic alteration, which is late stage and overprinting. So we're using the sulfide zoning here to help bring ourselves into the system. Now, this is a longitudinal section. On the left is the Northwest, on the right is the Southeast. And you can see this gentle plunge to the system. The black outline is greater than 0.9% copper equivalent. The blue is 0.3% going to surface. And you see the, this plunge is really a function of this D15 or QD15, these intramineral intrusions, which came a little bit later to the party, brought in some grade, but they came after the high grade pulse of the, of the QD10 in the D10. Uh, in other words, the pre-mineral intrusion intruded by the early mineral causal intrusion. And so it, it brings in a floor, a sloping floor of about 30 degrees of intermediate to lower grade. So that's solely a function of this later intrusion. And then you can see, again, the donut all the way around the outside, molybdenum, all right? And this, this intramineral intrusion, this D15, diorite 15, had a bit more molybdenum than everything else. So you get a bit higher uh, molybdenum when you get into this orange D15 intrusion, but you can still see the halo all around the high grade. Um, so again, this is that long section, slightly different scale. 
uh, showing the geology and the relationship to grade on the left and the vein abundance. You couldn't ask for a better, better proxy. You can visually estimate grade by the abundance of B veins and the abundance of chalcopyrite. And you know, that's because this deposit is pretty simple in that it's uh, largely fracture controlled and most of the copper is in chalcopyrite. And there's actually a pretty good relationship of the abundance of chalcopyrite to gold and a particular type of chalcopyrite where you have uh, chalcopyrite rich, they call them C veins or paint veins, overprinting early magnetite bearing B1 type quartz veins gives us the higher, highest amounts of gold. So let's do a level plan. We're going to cut a flat plan here at 500 meters above sea level, which is about 1100 meters below surface, below that discovery outcrop. And we'll see on the left hand diagram here the central uh, magenta quartz diorite 10 intrusion that's intruded within the pre mineral. Um, then the subsequent other orange D15 in blue. All right. Um, late breccias, hydrothermal breccia off the side. You can see the grade relationship. And then you can see that molybdenum halo around the outside. And on the right hand diagram, it's even more clear. So again, very good geometry, very predictable geometry. Um, so this is the level plan again, um, basically showing you the B vein abundance. And again, how well does the 5% B veins agree with the 0.9% copper equivalent uh, cutoff? And going way out, more importantly, the half percent veins. If you're drilling out here, you know, you can measure the strike and dip of veins if you're at surface. You can measure the strike and dip of veins in oriented core and vector yourself into the deposit. So there's the high grade core, but you've got those half percent fringe veins bringing you into the system. So very quick, uh, you can get this uh, in the summary and in the recording. So don't worry about taking notes. Basically hand-drawn and, and leapfrog models. That's what I was showing you. I was showing you slices uh, through the leapfrog model. We use SIRPAC as well. It doesn't have to be leapfrog, but something interactive. You can do 3D modeling. And before we had computers, we were doing just fine with using our heads as 3D modeling devices and level plans and cross sections. So that works too. Uh, and we were, we were focusing on molybdenum, chalcopyrite, pyrite ratio, boronite abundance, early and late stage hydrothermal alteration. I haven't shown you that as well. And we saw a direct relationship of all those attributes in those parameters grade. Um, and we noticed that we have these pre-mineral D10, which is the house invaded by the mineralizing QD10 that brought the metals to the party with subsequent intrusions, bringing less and less metal and eventually diluting the system. But fortunately, in Apollo, those late intrusions are volumetrically small. Um, molybdenum, very useful. And you can 6 ppm, 10 ppm molybdenum, just in looking at molybdenite on fractures. Wait for assays to come back to predict where, where, where your, your, your ore deposit might be in this case. The B vein abundance, very important. Uh, we talked about sulfide ratios. Deposit got a pyrite halo where you have two and a half to five percent volume percent pyrite surrounding a lower grade chalcopyrite rich core. Some deposits, no pyrite in this system, one to two and a half percent pyrite in the chalcopyrite copper gold core. Uh, we have, I haven't talked about it, but we have the basically you have a, a, an early stage low grade potassic alteration um, with actinolite along the fringe um, invading into a epidote and chloride propolytic alteration. That gets overprinted by chloride sericite alteration that brings the chalcopyrite and most of the pyrite to the party. Metal cap turned on here. It's not all about the potassium zone. That's preparation. It's about temperature, 400 degrees Celsius or lower uh, chloride sericite alteration that brought the copper in the party. And then later stages of phyllic advanced argillic kaolinitic alteration, uh, chloride smectite alteration as the, uh, waned. So yeah, it's not just because it's good science, although that's enjoyable, we do it because we're applied scientists and the direct application of the Honda method to mapping and core logging in this district has resulted in 22 million ounces of gold, 10 million metric tons of copper. So that's 22 billion pounds of copper and almost 100 million ounces of silver. This is one of the world's most recently discovered, one of the most recently discovered, one of the largest of the deposits. Okay, so applied science works. 
So we've gone from Bobby Hito in Indonesia, where I was first taught the Anaconda method um, by people like uh, Marco Anaudi, uh, John Prophet, John Dillis. Uh, and we've applied it with great success in Ecuador at Alpala for Sol Gold. Now here's another application uh, at a, a Cordillera in Northern Chile, which is a porphyry copper gold system that's very near the coast. All right, great infrastructure um, in, in the low Andes, 1100 meters above sea level uh, sort of elevations. And so it's a great location. Um, I worked with the last few years, I've been working with hot chili here and we've applied the Anaconda method to mapping to looking and nicely. Okay, so this basically it's a 91 million year old system. Um, and right now we take distant discovery of product Tora system to the west, the Cordillera, the Porphyry, which I'll be talking about is three quarters of a billion tons of, of metal, about a half percent copper equivalent. That's not a bad start. Uh, porphyritic uh, uh, sheeted quartz veins with gertite and pyrite. Uh, this is what a vein might look like at 700 meters down hole, 780 meters down hole. Um, again, the white gray tonalite, a uh, fair amount of phyllic alteration in this system with uh, stock work of quartz, chalcopyrite, pyrite veins with copper, gold, silver, and molybdenum. So this is a plan view looking down on a 3D model. Uh, you can see it's about 2.3 kilometers in length. Each grid there is a kilometer uh, for scale. There's three main ore bodies, Cuerpos 1, 2, and 3. And what we have uh, modeled um, late dikes in yellow, which ran northwest or south. We have these early intrusions in um, magenta and red. Uh, the early mineral and intramineral, they're the ones who brought the metals to the party. Um, you can see them, they're enters, and, they, and they're, they're along your northwest fracture corridor, which is just adjacent to a valley. So it's affected, it's been weathered uh, recessively due to all the phyllic and clay alteration. And where you have these northerly trending late dikes, they've come through and reopened up pathways and basically you free beads along the string. The west structures are known south and you get three porphyry systems, three fingers, which appear to be joining up at depth. I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, and then you've got sort of a proximal and distal hornfells, scarn um, alteration where you've got um, bedding texture can be destroyed if you're close to these thermally recrystallized um, rocks, okay? So here also there is a relationship of the intrusion stages to copper, gold, silver, and molybdenum. Similar thing, we've got the wall rocks here in green, our, our volcanic, volcanic class. Uh, we have these distal uh, texture preserved uh, horn fells. You know, proximal texture destroyed hornfells into the main mineralizing intrusions that are the, the 10 and 20 series, early mineral, intramineral, into the late lower grade and barren dikes. So you can see the same relationship we see with respect to grade uh, at Apala and in many porphyry systems. We see that here, uh, um, grade to the stages of intrusions. So I'll just take you a cross section from B to B prime through the largest uh, deposit in the Cordillera um, cluster. And so this is a cross section. You can see that's 1.4 kilometers, all right, in vertical scale um, with a width of, I have to see, we can get some things out of the way, a width of about maybe 500 meters, 400 meters here. So it really is a bit of a pencil. And you can see the intrusions, uh, the and intramineral in magenta and red being cut by the late low dike here in yellow. Uh, you can see the volcanic sedimentary rocks dipping shallowly off to the south. Um, and you can see copper grains. Okay. Go. And there's a 0.3% equivalent outline. So it is about those 10 and 20 series uh, intrusions and in their adjacent wall rock. So on the left hand side, this is early veins and veins. We'll call them A and B type veins using the nomenclature Gustafsson and Hunt. And generally, they have a good, a good relationship to grade. At however a depth, you can have a lot of early veins that are low in copper. These early veins are more magnetite, quartz bearing. Um, the chunk of tap, if you will, didn't turn on later until you get into the B veins. Um, so that's why here you can have 
um, abundant early iron and silica, then they have copper. And then we can see uh, an outdated model here. Uh, hot chili is in the process of upgrading their resource, and that will be out in the next uh, few couple months um, and or sooner actually, and that will be interesting, uh, adding high grade to the core of the system. Uh, but you can gen again see the general relationship of higher grade to greater abundance of veins, particularly when you have the later stage copper bearing veins. And then it also has a molybdenum halo, although there's more molybdenum here at Cordadera than there is at Apollo or Batahija. And again, you can see it's like the lungs to the, to the high grade core. And so looking at veins, it's not just the abundance of veins. Here we're showing you an outline of 2% quartz veins and how that uh, mirrors or, or you know, makes a, a, a halo to the high grade core. 3% would even be better, a better agreement to the high grade core. And you can see uh, we have from a stereo net here and rose diagram, there are deep veins that strike Northwest dominantly, parallel to that main string of cuerpos, string of deposits. There's also Northeasters, there's some North Southers, but there's also flat veins. And that's this population here with vertical poles. And the interesting thing is we go ahead and since the core is oriented, we measure many veins going down the drill hole and we determine through Sterionet populations um, what's the primary set, the most abundant set, the secondary set. Um, we, and we're showing you those as averages about every 100 meters down hole with these little red and blue discs or glyphs uh, in, in leapfrog. You see there's steeper veins. You get down to the depth where we start to get more flat veins. And this happens to be where we get out of our highest grades. And so this area in here, if you go to like 0.6%, is the highest grades where the deep, but that also includes some of these flat veins. So again, not just the abundance of veins, but in some cases, the geometry of veins can help you predict um, what the high grade might be. Um, well, we've done some calculated mineralogy, and, and that's another talk, but it's basically using geochemistry and logging um, to help calculate the abundance of silicon sulfide minerals, oxide minerals. What we have here is we, we have the, the higher copper core, which has got a fair amount of sericite alteration grading outwards into sericite chloride out into just chloride propylytic with sort of this overprinting uh, or this albitic alteration, all right, which can be stable with chloride, but it's also stable with the sericite. And I should say the albite is kind of a transitional early to intermediate stage of alteration, whereas the sericite Later, in the, uh, here we can see the molybdenum uh, um, greater than 50, kind of flanking the high grade copper, which is color coded here. I have magenta down the traces of the hole. And we can see we are pyrite halo, greater than 6% pyrite in yellow, about 2 to 4% pyrite in blue. All right, so very much giving you a halo. So again, B veins here, molybdenum here, abundance of chalcopyrite, pyrite, chalcopyrite, pyrite ratio, even, even the alteration help you predict where the high grade core is of this system. So I've given you three very quick examples of why geology counts and how it's well expressed in porphyry systems. You can apply this to regional exploration. You can apply this to growing your ore body. Porphyry deposits large, they carry lots of metals. And again, these basic field-based methods work. Uh, and it's something to keep in mind. Um, and it's old fashioned, but it works and you can integrate it with 3D modeling. You can integrate it with your geophysics. And it's just another tool, another arrow in the quiver to shoot at the target when you're exploring for porphyry copper deposits. And I'd like to acknowledge the Anaconda, the Anaconda mining geologists in the 70s in Nevada and, and uh, Chile, um, Newmont um, and Sol Gold and Hot Chile. Um, for um, basically providing the basis for this talk. Thank you.